Shmuel! We're so happy today to have Batya Meidad from Shiloh. And uh, we're going to talk today about Andy Kaufman and Taxi. And Taxi. And uh, all the offshoots of Taxi. There was a lot of people who made it big yeah. after Taxi. So, yeah. Um, first, tell us a bit about yourself. Myself? <laughs> um, let's see. Where do I start? All right. I'm a generation more, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, Grew up in, in New York. First lived in Bayside, New York, and Queens. And then we, at, when I was 13, we moved to Great Neck. And Andy Kaufman was in my class. I mean, this was a public school, a class of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids. I can't say I knew everyone, but I did know Andy. We weren't buddies, but we spoke. I think he thought I was weird. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> did you think he was weird? No, he it was. Like the movie it was a, him like a weird character. I know. He it definitely. I don't know if you got to see his the the biopic they did on I him, saw. Man in the Moon. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now, as, as, you know, as I've been waiting for, for this, um, thinking about what to say. Now, why was he using this incomprehensible made-up language in his latka uh, role? <laughs> and then it hit me that when I moved to Great Neck, now Great Neck was very different from Bayside. It's, it was like a 10-minute drive, but it was like going into another world. Uh, where I lived in Bayside, it was um, what was called Veterans Authority Housing and all the fathers had been in the American Armed Forces during World War II because it was for veterans. And post-war, um, which was actually post-depression, there was no housing for all of these guys and their families, and they were in rush. Some of them started the families before they went in, and everyone was in a rush to, to live someplace nice and have a family. So the government, I presume all over the states, but certainly in most of Queens, New York, built government housing. And we were in a garden apartment. And a garden apartment was in some ways like Ishu, which was one of the reasons <coughs> why I wanted to live in, a, in something like that. And I found we ended up in Chilo because we had, we had um, playgrounds and, and courtyards, and it was small apartments and very friendly and everyone was the same age and for some peculiar reason it was about 95 percent jewish i think <laughs> that the um the, the jews were most desperate to go to yenemsville any place <laughs> any place far from the slums <coughs> where they had been raised yeah. And uh, there was very little housing near them. The, the Christians wanted to be near a church. Mm -hmm. and, they would have, and the Jews just said, okay, I don't want the type of shul stebel where my parents raised me, so we'll, we'll build our own. And um, we ended up with a very large uh, conservative shul that kept growing and growing and growing. The rabbi being Orthodox, that was very common in, in the States. And so this was, I guess, what you would call an upwardly mobile, um, lower to middle, more sort of lower um, class in terms of finances um, community. Anyone who had enough money moved out or they bought, bought a summer home and, and they went there in the summer. So we ended up buying a house in Great Neck. Now, Great Neck had the name of being a very wealthy place. I think our street, Second Road, first of all, the idea that it was called, had a number. No, ha no streets in Great Neck outside of Second Road and Fourth Road had numbers. We were like, it was a, probably the lowest ha priced street in all of Jewish Great Neck. And so when I moved there and suddenly I'd hear people talking about things. I remember someone saying that so-and-so did a terrible thing. She wore socks with her papagallos, and I didn't know what papagallos were. So I think that basically, okay, Andy wasn't that far from me, but I mean, his street had a, probably a, 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 a tree name, which, <laughs> which was you know considered more. But pe status. people did speak different languages according to their socioeconomic uh, world. 
And for those who still don't know, Papagallo's are um, a fancy Italian shoe brand. They were not Tom McCann's, and they weren't you know cheap stuff at all. Everything. Probably one pair it would be double my entire shoe wardrobe at the time, <laughs> if not triple. You know, maybe even ten so times. So you were in school with Andy. I was in school with Andy, and it was a cliquey type of community. It's either you were the Arista, the it, this this was a school where. The kids who were the top students were also the top athletes. And then you had the, the jocks. Who, no, they weren't really jocks. Then you had the Catholic kids. And they were, they went to, for them, shop was, was their thing. And the ninth grade, there were more Catholics came in because they were the ones who weren't allowed into the Catholic high school. Mm. So I got to know them. I mean, I probably knew more of the um, of the less popular crowd of anyone. And Andy was in his own world also. I and mean, that's the way that's the way things were. You just I never quite fit in there. So my 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 big thing and how I became me, and the me you see, is that um, our synagogue had a teen club. And my I remember my father dragging me into this car, the second-hand car we had that had a hole in the, in the, on the bottom, so you could. It was pretty cruddy in, in the when it was cold, and anyhow, so he dragged me off one Saturday night to the shul that we were members of. It was an Orthodox shul, Great Nick Synagogue, and it had very few members, and they had some rich people who decided they wanted an Orthodox shul. And he said, "There's a teen club." And you're going to like it whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> you have house. to make friends. <laughs> my house, my house. <laughs> That's the way parents spoke to their kids in those days. And I liked it. Yeah. And I became very active, chapter president, as part of NCSY. I became regional vice president. I even after, I mean, shocking everyone, including myself, I became religious. Wow. Through NCSY, and I have a national officer too, and so I was as weird as one could be in Great Neck. <laughs> Did you keep in touch with Andy? No, we never kept in touch. We weren't. There's actually like out of my whole class of hundreds of kids, there's one friend I'm really in touch with. She actually made Ali a few years ago, and we became religious together. We call yeah. it. I call her my partner in crime because for our. our that sort of the becoming religious you didn't even hear the word Jose Vajuva that didn't exist becoming religious was was not what people did I mean our parents generation became American right. and so we were considered worse than rebels we were considered crazy <laughs> <laughs> so so that was it but it, it, the 50s was I mean we'll get back to the TV business yeah mm -hmm. um the 50s, the television shows were actually very different. They were family shows. Okay. And a family was a mother, a, father. a mother and a father and kids. You had some real families like the Ozzy and, Nail Ozzy and Harriet Nelson the family. I forgot the name of the show now. And their son Ricky became an, a performer. He was a singer. You had I Love Lucy where she was with her husband, and when she was pregnant, the Lucy character was pregnant, yeah. and she had Desi Jr., and that's what a family was. And then things, by the time the, I guess it was the, the 70s, 80s came around, and you ended up with Andy's uh, taxi show, they, that was the genre of the friends, people mm. working together, right. or hanging out together, or half living together, and all sorts of combinations there and but that they weren't married and raising children right right and so that was a du totally different world tell us what you like about the show the, the first of all it was funny but first of all it was just this Nahas saying oh <laughs> I knew Andy when he was in high school <laughs> we were in the same classes and yeah. and then we, we had some groups of volunteers coming to to Shiloh in the we are here since 81 
And when they found out, oh, I went to school with Andy, it made me a, <laughs> like a, I was a real celebrity, <laughs> you know, because he was a real person. Yeah. To me, he was a real person. Yeah. And, um, you know, there were, there were very few, very few people that I can say I knew way back when. Mm -hmm. He became somebody. Yeah, he became yeah. somebody, but, but he had, um, he had his problems and he, and he, he died young uh, of cancer, which was sad. Yeah. And um, when, when I look at his character in Taxi, so one thing I really like about him is like he brings uh, genuine innocence. <laughs> I, it's like it's on the border between real stupid and innocent, <laughs> but, but there is like this sense of innocence about him. And I think that's something that made everybody fall in love with this character. And when I saw the, the, the biopic, so it, like people were demanding him to do Latka all the time. And I was asking myself, it's not such a funny character, more like, you know, it's like somebody who agrees to be in a place where I don't really know much and it's okay and I don't know how things work in the world, but I'm okay with it, you know? But he was always nice. I mean, he was like the, a nice character. I think yeah, all of the, yeah. the, actually that entire, I've watched a few of the shows recently. They're very cynical. They're very, very yeah. sexist and very chauvinist and very... <laughs> but, but he was in a world of his own yeah, and yeah. he was always, he was always nice and he played the straight man. Right. You know, so it's nothing. You didn't see him smiling and making a joke. He everything react, for, came from him, which is really probably for a for a comic or an actor. But I remember once reading, he said he's not a comedian. You know, he was just he played what he felt like doing. And he the idea, I mean, in the '60s, growing up in the '60s. I don't know how it how people think of it today, but you were supposed to be an individualist or a nonconformist. Mm -hmm. But then again, being a nonconformist was not quite what a nonconformist is. It's like, today I'm always saying you have to use um, uppercase L for, for, for a liberal I ideology and lowercase for the adjective. <laughs> because, I guess it's because I once overheard some people saying that all the nonconformists have, um, have book bags, <laughs> have green book bags, and I figured, a nonconformist means you have to be yourself, right. a little different from other people. Yeah. I mean, I was, you know, people like me and Andy, we were the real nonconformists. Right. But because we didn't have the right book bag, we <laughs> were, we, <laughs> you know, this, this was, it was a, a really strange world. So It's like that today, you know, if you're not, if you don't have the, the cool clothes, the cool bag, you're not part of the in crowd. You're, mm -hmm. You know, you have to find your own way. And I think today, it's actually a lot harder to find your own way than it was, like, I, I mean, I'm for sure when I was little. Um, well, was, where did you grow up? I grew up in Toronto. Um, I grew up, um, we were poor. I mean, not, we did okay, but I was in a school with, um, I, I mean, the president of American Express was my <laughs> classmate and he had his own credit card at 13 years old. Those are the type of people I was in school with. So by comparison, um, we were like, it, it, it was hard, you know, and, and it forced me to be an individual. I kept kosher and nobody else kept kosher. Oh, you went to public school? No. I, I mean, in high school, I went to public school, but in, uh. in, in, in elementary, I was in a Jewish school and I was the only one that kept kosher. And it was, very, it was very hard. Everybody's swapping sandwiches, and I can't. Everybody's bringing their Halloween candy, and I can't. They're all having parties at Chuck E. Cheese, and I can't. It's all on Saturday, and I can't. So it made me different. In wow. retrospect, it made me, it gave me like a, a spine and a individuality and creativity. But um, I didn't have the looks. I didn't have the bag. I didn't have, um, and it was, it was hard. It was, it was hard. But today, to be an individual... I think it's much harder because you, you have so much standards to measure yourself by, no? Life is more public oh, today, oh. isn't it? Yeah, definitely. You know, we had, you, you lived in your little bubbles in my day. I mean, you didn't <laughs> have a cell phone right. and you, 
you didn't have the internet and you didn't have YouTube or, or any of these things. So, right. so life was, you could be very isolated in your own world and not know it. Right, right. I want to ask you as a blogger and somebody who, who is out there and all the technologies that there are, how do you do it? I mean, how, did you make like a decision that you want to be part of it? Because not a lot of people your age are, are friends with technology. <laughs> You know, a lot of them are anti, like my, my, um, my stepfather-in-law, he doesn't even have a cell phone. Wow. Oh my God. That's, that <laughs> means, you know what it means? It means that he's free. See, I, I'll yeah. tell you, how did I get old with technology? I mean, when we first came to Shiloh, I guess the following year, um, I ended up doing public relations for the history yeshiva here. And in the first few months that I did it, I did everything at home. I, Ruff Brom would come over and tell me who donated money and what, whom I should write to. And we had a manual typewriter and I'd sit at home and I would type and then I would give him the letters. We would exchange the stuff every, every, every couple of days. And, um, then they set up the office and they got an electric typewriter mm. that had a one-line memory. So if I caught my mistakes early enough, I didn't have to throw the pages in the garbage. Because I learned how to type in the seventh grade before we moved to Great Neck, and I was the worst typist. <laughs> I'm telling you, the, the worst typist. Well, first of all, I mean, we had these Remington typewriters that were like oh my this God. high, and you sat up straight, and <laughs> and you had to use real strength and memorize, and it was just not my thing. But I'd say, of all the things I ever learned in school, typing. Yes. Was, yeah. Touch yeah. typing is the best, and it's the thing I use daily. Yeah. So, um, ended up typing then, a friend made Aliyah, and she said that she uses this newfangled thing called a computer, a word processor program, and she can do our letters, take the same text and keep changing the name and changing the number <laughs> and all sorts of, and, and I told my bosses about it, and they were enamored. We, we even paid her to do a whole batch of of letters for us. I think I gave the basic text and she did it all. And then we decided we needed to buy one, we, the, the yeshiva. So um, so they, they arranged it through some of the people who were, I guess they were early, Machon um, Lev and Technion and whatever people who were in the yeshiva. I mean, you look at them today and you say, they, these are old men, but they're all younger than me by a few years. And, <laughs> And we went to pick up these, these, this, this newfangled computer. <coughs> we went to Bar Ilan, and there somebody programmed it with, um, I think it was WordStar or something like that. And, um, and they gave us a little bit of instruction, which like went beyond. And, and, then as, and they said, and it has this thing called a hard disk. It's very sensitive. It cannot shake, rattle, and roll. It just has to, you have to be really careful. So, of course, it's in those days, you didn't have Kvish Chotze Shomron. We, we went through, um, at, what's it called, that Arab city? Um, Ramallah? No, no, we're coming from Barilan. Oh. Uh, I forget, all of a sudden, I forget. It's, it's next to Rosha Ayan. And um, so we... Kassim. Kfar Kassim, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, all of a sudden, in the middle of the Kfar Kassim, we hear, Foom! Somehow the tire went. Oops. <laughs> and it was also a, a nasty rainy day. And where do you think the spare was in, in the station under wagon? The <laughs> of course it was under the computer. <laughs> so we had to take this crazy computer, this newfangled computer, very delicate, very expensive, put it on the road and they changed the tire. We put it back in and we're still driving back to, to Shiloh. And just as we hit um, the uh, 
Tapuach Junction, it's Apple Junction, you know, Summit uh, Tapuach, uh, we found a Jewish uh, van on its side, and we went to try to rescue the family. There was a family, they, were, they weren't injured, so they take out these cute little blonde kids, and then a very pregnant uh, mother with a tinchal, and then a one-legged man. He lost the leg years before, but it was still a bit weird. Everyone who could fit in squeezed into the car, and one of the guys stayed with their van because the, the father was very upset that, his, the, that the Arabs would steal things. And we made it back to Shiloh, and then I was taught how to use a computer. I got a one-word lesson from Yossi Epter. Sach ki, play. <laughs> I can see him saying that, too. <laughs> Oh, so you know him. So he, and, and I was taught, of course, how to turn it on and off. And, and I said, what if I break something? And he said, call me up, I'll fix it. And that was it. I became the probably the oldest com <laughs> computer whiz. And since then, I use that same Yossi After lesson, Sakhki. I play with it. Because wow. you, you can, especially nowadays, everything you can undo, 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 undo. I people have actually don't tell them tax people they've actually paid me to teach them how to use a new phone which I'd never seen before a, a new a computer which I've never I don't have such a fancy one in my house but but Yossi's instructions really worked so also I had these delusions a few decades ago that I could really be a, a freelance writer and then um, I found it was easier to blog because then I could put everything up. I used to blog on two blogs every single day. Now, if I blog on one or two of them every week, it's a lot. I just sort of got sort of blogged out. <laughs> and, um, and I just, but I can do it. I do Facebook, I do blogging. I went to all of these media things and then they said, oh, but you have to do Instagram and you have to do, so I have Instagram and I have Twitter. Do you have TikTok? What? Do you have TikTok? I started getting into it, and then I said no. <laughs> but I probably will. Never say never is my <laughs> motto yeah. at this point. And um, you know, what did I do? Ah, during um, um, during the the lockdown, I I was reading children's stories every day on Facebook Live. Oh wow! And um, all that stuff. So I really mean, I'm it. like you're really up to date. I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, my computer is old. I mean, but it, you don't have to. My phone, oh, the latest up to date is like when you get hearing aids and you use the Bluetooth. And then I had to get a new phone because my other new phone didn't, didn't have compatible Bluetooth to the hearing aids. So that's, <clears throat> that's what happens when you're old. But if you, you learn how to you have overcome. To learn, you have to, you're saying you have to learn how to adapt also. Yes, that's it. Adapt. You learn how, I couldn't adapt to Great Nick. But I've adapted to technology. <laughs> That's wow. amazing. Anything else you want to share with us about uh, either Life, about challenges, whatever taxi, <laughs> taxi? Well, the thing is, you had told me also to look into who's the boss. Yeah, yeah. And I because you have uh, Tony dances and yeah, both of them, right? And I could not stop laughing listening to some of these. Who's the boss? I think it's one of the most underappreciated yeah. comedies. And so this became, all right, Taxi, I said, was like the genre of Friends. Right. And even if any of you have seen Happy Endings that Adam Pally put out, he's related, we, we married into the same family. Um, so anyhow, the thing with um, Who's the Boss is the pair, if you should really be pairing that up with the nanny, because that's the same genre of having the attraction uh, between you have a housekeeper and a. Um, Ooh, I think you've just given us a nice next week's show. <laughs> <Sure. Yeah. laughs> and and a and a and a single parent boss, and yeah. the, the the stuff that goes on and the and the sexual tension between yeah. them, yeah. And, and and it's hysterical. You know, like these are that became. The new family, as I said in the beginning, I mean, in my when I was a kid, we had Father Knows Best and I Love Lucy. And then you ended up with all of these, these um, friends things 
uh, I guess Sex and the whatever it is called, the City or something, or but he had all these yeah. shows. I don't know how many came to Israel. I mean, not that I watched them. I mean, I'm in Israel since 1970, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But nowadays you can get virtually everything right, on. Right. And I think also, it, it's, it's funny, I, if you even see Law and Order yeah. and the stuff you'll find on the media about Law and Order, okay. you find out that it's really very much like Taxi. Because it's it has to do in terms of the friendship and family genre. Ah, okay. Yeah, you know, it's, a ho- okay. it's mostly single people Right. right. And their interactions. Right. right. And so, so that became w- what it is. I mean, you have, it's, and then you had your odd families. And the first odd families were the, with things like the nanny and, and who's the boss. And yeah. now you have, I don't know if you want to call it your woke or woke friendly families on, on TV. I don't think it's hit Israel yet, but, um, but it's because it's all part of trying to be accepted yeah. to turn the what was formerly called abnormal into normal acceptance because you're not allowed to say anything is abnormal, but but they're allowed to make fun of us. Yeah. Right. Which yeah. becomes you're that you see uh, decline. Are you saying, oh, we're not allowed to say that. I mean, that's <laughs> where we see changes, <laughs> drastic changes. changes. Ironic changes, but we're okay. never allowed to put them down. I mean, when when I became there, I was in Great Neck North, and I was becoming religious and a Soviet Jewry activist. And, I, and I mean, this was the very beginning of Soviet Jewry activism in the in the mid sixties. Right. Um, and everyone else, all the normal people, were going to civil rights demonstrations, and. Um, and and I said, but this is civil rights, right? You know th- that the Jews should be able to be practicing Jews in the Soviet Union. Isn't that their civil rights? And people Apparently would go, not. <laughs> no. Well, they they told me it was too far away, <laughs> even though they were the school was over fifty percent Jewish. But and these were the Jewish kids saying, oh, it's too far away. We can't relate to it. We're Americans first. And then they got into one of this, there was something going on, I think, in Africa. And they got into that, too. And I go, but isn't that far away? <laughs> you know, and, but, I don't know, and we never spoke the same language, which is probably why Latka spoke his made-up language on the show, because yeah. if you didn't follow what everyone else was doing, you were talking a different language. And then they had, ah, uh, then there was the Vietnamese War, and you weren't allowed to give an opinion like, you support communists? Communists are the ones who were persecuting Jews. And no, you weren't allowed to say that, because that didn't, <laughs> didn't jive with their, with, with right. what was the acceptable thing. So... I mean, I didn't get normal, I think, basically, almost until I came to Shiloh, you know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's hysterical. You became a right-wing fanatical, uh, you know, person, and and, and that's where you say you became normal. (laughs) Look, you have to, okay, to date me even more is that I finished high school with the Six-Day War. The Six-Day War was... An amazing thing. I had just learned about the importance of Zionism and Jews living in Israel barely a year before that. And that was from, I must say, Dennis Lipkin, who was a year ahead of us in high school, a year ahead of Mm -hmm. me. So it's like, of all the people he made Aliyah even before me, I was the second one from our crowd to make Aliyah from the Mm -hmm. great neck crowd, all of four of us or something. Uh, Wow. I mean, as the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jews who were in school, when we were in school, there's, I don't know if there's more than a handful here. Wow. And I'm not, you know, like... Crazy. It's just, because the whole point was to be American. American. So, um, we're going to sum up? Yeah, you've shared with us um, really (laughs) a big journey of, also of life, I think, and also of television shows, which sometimes reflect society. You, you've shared with us a big, um, um, what's the word, like, 
Span? Span. Span, that's the word. Thank you. Um, that's, it, it's amazing to see that. That, that. That's just like an amazing reflection. And it gives you food for thought. Because today, so thank you. you were saying reflecting. I think today what's happened, and apparently there's now a big fight in the whole Disney uh, bureaucracy business, that they try to not reflect on society, but influence society. And and suddenly, apparently, they they had someone very woke who was who was bringing in things that I'm sure old Walt is like, say he's rolling over in his grave is a is is a mild statement. He's probably trying to bury himself down to China, um, but then they found they were losing money, so they brought in somebody who used to work and trying to get back to more of more older family values yeah. Mm. yeah because most people which is one of the reasons why um why trump got in um do not like these newfangled mm. ideas yes <laughs> ideologies this is interesting yeah, yeah it's I really mean, interesting what you're saying um wow so we are coming to the end of uh, the schmooze thank yeah. you so much for being on with us and, and you definitely inspired us i think really uh, yeah really <laughs> <laughs> to to be our own individual yeah doesn't matter if somebody calls us not normal oh, and... I mean, to me it's a compliment you really <laughs> want to be you want to be like them yeah. <laughs> And also, and also to play. I love that tip that you got from Yossi. Uh, yeah. To, to play with technology, to anything new. Uh, the attitude of playing is something that, uh, as, you see, as you see on Batya, it's ageless. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, we had a great time schmoozing with you. We did. Thank and you. It took us a while. Yeah, we, got, well, we, got, yeah. we, got, we got you here yeah. in the end. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for coming on our show. Well, thank maybe you you'll invite so me again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I also like the the fact that you, sh you just shared a, a lot of your wisdom, a lot of a lot of your perspective that we don't have. Um, you shared that, and that that gives you um, perspective. Who said it? A man without history is a man without something. Somebody famous said something famous like that. Look it up on the yeah. web, <laughs> right? Um, so you need that perspective. And so right. really thank you for giving us that, that perspective. Oh, I'm glad you appreciate it. I do. We do. We do <laughs> totally. Thank you so much. It was great. Yeah. This has been a great episode. And we will see you next week on The, the Shrew! Shrew!